Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the third part of module 3. We are talking about frames and metaphors and metonymy in this section. So far we have seen that metaphors are a particular way of conceptualizing the abstract domain, which for many of us starts with the linguistic metaphors, uh, which is typically understood as a flower use of language. And then, but then we saw that it is not merely so. The linguistic aspect of metaphor, which is what we uh, typically encounter, actually is the outcome of a mapping at a much deeper level. Mapping at the level of concepts, how we understand one conceptual domain through the uh, structure of another conceptual domain. And this is typically more often than not used for understanding the abstract domains. A lot of abstract domains are nearly impossible to conceptualize or at least to talk about without referring to some amount of concrete anchoring, let us call it. So, this anchoring is done through the use of metaphors and we have seen that because of this particular factor, we call metaphors conceptual metaphors in this course. So, many concepts uh, especially the abstract concepts are structured and represented in terms of metaphors. So, they are not only structured, but also represented in terms of uh, by, by the use of metaphors. So, basically we have looked at how abstract concepts may various abstract concepts like time, like life, like uh, relationships and so on, how they are structured and how they are represented and hence how they are understood. So, metaphor thus is a cognitive phenomena, it is not merely a linguistic phenomena, it is a cognitive phenomena, it is a mental phenomena, how we make sense. Remember we started this course with the whole understanding of what is cognition, how do we understand, how do we uh, know that we know certain things and how do we use that understanding and that knowledge. Similarly, uh, in the with the idea of metaphor as well, we have, uh, we have seen the same thing. So, how do we uh, create cognitive schemata in terms of metaphor? And then we also saw that this particular process, this particular process of mapping one concrete domain on a, an abstract domain is also related to, if not entirely dependent upon, it is related to culture. So, now we will move on with slightly more detailed understanding of how, um, uh, how the, what we mean by this particular thing of cognitive as well as cultural phenomena, we will look at certain empirical evidence. But before that, let us just unpack this idea of um, a co being a cognitive phenomena little more. Metaphors are often called embodied simulation. Remember when we discussed the fundamental aspects of metaphor, we talked about how bodily experiences, lived experiences are often if not always often at the core of creating metaphors. This is more true of emotion metaphors than any other domain. So, it is not only the case of metaphors which is dependent on uh, embodiment, but also many other kinds of understanding as we will gradually see in this course. So, embodied simulation is an integral part of human conceptualization, how we cognize the world has a lot to do with how we simulate certain situations, certain understanding, certain events and objects and so on in our life. So, humans engage in embodied simulation quite often at various times for various purposes. For example, for communicative purposes, for uh, know, solving cognitive problems and so on and so forth. 
not only that how do we not only this is uh, uh, understood at the theoretical level, but also we have adequate um, uh, empirical evidence from the domain of neuroscience. So, neuroscience research reveals that brain areas associated with uh, visual processing of motion are active when people see pictures depicting real as well as implied motions. So, basically what we what this means is that neuroscience has given us um, proof that brain areas are active brain areas which is related to motion perceiving motion understanding motion are active not only when we see real uh, movement of objects in space whether it is a human walking or uh, um, a, a large uh, uh, boulder rolling down the slopes of a mountain and so on and so forth there can be various such kind of locomotions. So, not only we uh, activate our brain areas are uh, related to motion are activated when we see a real motion happening, but also when a motion is implied. This is often the case in case of um, cartoons. So, you know in uh, also in pictures. So, this is a static picture, but there is certain there are certain uh, tricks that cartoonists employ uh, for example, using um, something somewhat like this. So, there is a let us say this is a boulder and then you have a, a motion as some like this and it. Uh, it might imply motion the, the, the horizontal lines might imply motion. So, this kind of uh, actions this kind of uh, this kind of locomotions in space can also be implied. Now, what the brain does is in both the real in both the case of real motion as well as implied motion the brain areas that is connected to motion uh, perception is, uh, is activated. What that means is that uh, is that we simulate. So, when we see an implication of a thing happening in front of us, even if it is not really happening in real terms, we still are able to understand by simulating it. So, we are basically creating recreating the event in our brain in order to make sense of it. Now, this is a fundamental underpinning on which a lot of metaphorical um, understanding of in language is dependent on. In, in fact, a lot of um, uh, empirical experiments empirical data come from this but, uh, important hypothesis that this is already uh, this already happens human brains are capable of simulating things when even when they are not happening. So, there are uh, in applying this idea in terms of metaphoric understanding in terms of metaphor processing there are many uh, studies that have taken place both in terms of um, structural as well as in interview method as well as in uh, by using various kinds of experimental setup. There are all the, let us talk about the uh, structural understanding first. So, when asked about how you know to talk about racism or to talk about certain other ideas for example, um, a difficult idea that you have been given any person has been given for that matter and then it is very common to talk about it in terms of you know to grasp the concept chew on the idea and so on and so forth turning turning it in my head and so on. So, it is very very common if we just go about analyzing the structural way in which people talk about um, con uh, difficult concepts abstract difficult concepts it is very common to use the words like grasp you know he is he was quick to grasp the idea let me chew on the idea let me turn it in my head a bit. So, basically this is almost you are simulating while you are talking about an abstract concept in this way the idea is that you are simulating the concrete aspect. So, the metaphorical mapping basically takes you to the concrete domain in your mind in your brain and then you are simulating the same thing. So, uh, basically you are almost looking at an idea, idea is an abstract concept. So, you are looking at the idea as if you are turning it in your hand, you are holding it in your hand and then turning it and twisting it and trying to see all the sides of it, which basically means analyzing a particular idea from every possible angle. Similarly, uh, the idea of the, the way you talk about racism. So, one we have to stomp out racism, we have to uh, and these days more common is smash patriarchy. Patriarchy is an idea and it uh, so it is a, it is essentially an abstract domain, but we can talk about smashing it because we are able to simulate this as as if it is a concrete thing and you can just take it and throw it down so that it breaks into pieces and so on. So, this has been this kind of research has this is one line of research that looks at 
processing of metaphor in terms of a concrete um, object and how we simulate that. So, basically this means this brings us to a situation where embodied experience can inform possible metaphor. We have already seen that, that embodied experiences of uh, throughout your lifetime. In fact, Lakoff has a very interesting take on this, Lakoff uh, whose work uh, on pen metaphor actually built the, the shaped the whole, uh, whole area, whole domain of understanding of metaphor. Lakoff says that from childhood, from pre-linguistic stages, even pre-conceptual stages of children, certain experiences go on repeating itself, there are recursivity in experiences. So, a child looks at two things, for example, uh, he, his famous example is that a child sees his mother, you know, filling up a glass with, uh, with, uh, with uh, milk or water or whatever, as, as it gets filled up, the, uh, it is, you know, the milk comes up. So, the verticality attached to more, so more is up is a connection that the child makes from the very beginning of her life, his or her life in, the, uh, in this case. Similarly, many others. So, basically our lived experiences, even if we are not conscious of it, this connection gets built up over a period of time and this connection also gets built up not only in terms of uh, you know, uh, two, two concrete experiences, but also in terms of the brain areas responsible for that and that is why we talked about neuro neuronal underpinning of metaphor. So, basically in embodied experiences make us, make humans open to creating metaphors, open to the so, the creation of two domains that can come together and um, you know uh, one can help understand the other. So, this is already dependent on the embodied experiences, but now whether or not a particular culture decides to use a particular uh, metaphor is dependent on the cultural model. This is something we have talked about in the in the last uh, lecture, but uh, uh, though in short. So, cultural model, what is a cultural model? Cultural model is nothing but a fancy term of the way a cultural group looks at a particular concept. So, this is, uh, this is almost, uh, almost um, invariant across people within a particular culture. So, for example, the understanding of time. Time we have seen in the last lecture that time can be understood as a moving entity or a static entity and if, uh, so either time moves or the ego moves, there are, the, there are these various possibilities but not all cultures look at time moving in the same direction. So, for example, uh, in case of Arabic time might move uh, from right to left, but in English speaker time might move from left to right, but time moves in certain uh, domains. Similarly, many other such concepts that get metaphorized in terms of a culture specific way. We have already seen how cultures can differ from one another at the specific level. So, even though at the generic level we do tend to be, we, we, we tend to be you know on agreement, in agreement in case of certain embodied metaphor, embodied understanding of metaphor like the case of anger, like the case of um, you know, love and like the case of life and so on. However, there are those culture specific with differences in which we look at the specifics of that metaphor. So, that is where cultural model comes in. So, cultural models therefore, often act as a filter of metaphor. So, choice of metaphor, the possibilities at the embodied level exists, but what we choose to create, what we choose to map is dependent on the group of people that is using that particular language. So, basically metaphors and metaphors bring us together with the cultural aspect of understanding metaphor and as well as the embodied understanding. So, let us look at this in a bit close the in a little bit more in detail. So, what do we mean by this cultural aspect of you know cultural model of metaphor with two examples. One is time is space and time is money. Time is space metaphor we have already seen that temporality is more often than not understood through space. So, we can say that you know uh, the, the time for action has come or you know uh, let us um, that the, this is that time of the, the week just whizzed past and so on and so forth. It is very common to use uh, spatial terms as if something is moving across you know in horizontally or in case of Chinese even vertically. So, time is space is a near universal metaphor. So, this is where more or less there is a, uh, there is a lot of agreement across cultural um, models. However, time is money is, these are some examples uh, from uh, Kapil's paper. 
So, this is uh, that this week has just whizzed by in a blur time for action has arrived. So, this is what is the time um, uh, time move movement of time and the ego is static in this case. So, the best part of the show is coming up. So, this, these are some of the examples very commonly cited, uh, used examples of time is space metaphor. And then this is a new metaphor for time, time is money is comparatively new and it is most of more often than not found in the industrial um, western industrial societies and of course, now it is being used in other parts of the world as well. So, when industrial revolution came in the amount of time you spent on a particular uh, work on a particular you know, uh, machine and so on and so forth, then, then that kind of translates into money that you make. So, the our very uh, concept of man hour comes from that, man hour basically is dependent on the idea of time is money. So, this much of effort you put and accordingly you get rewarded or uh, paid or whatever. So, this is these are some of the examples that that takes us to that fundamental understanding of time is money. The flat tire cost me an hour, I have invested a lot of time in her you are running out of time, we run out of money. So, you are running out of uh, time, budget your time, do not use your time profitably and so on and so forth. There are innumerable examples I have um, this is this is a, these examples are given by Lekoff and Johnson themselves in their seminal book. So, these are the two ways of understanding time fine. So, there are this is as I said cultural models also play an important role. So, this is a kind of metaphor that may not be existent for example, in non industrial societies. There are some societies that are still there in the world which are not which are not industrial societies. So, there you may not find this. So, far so good. So, languages differ cultures differ and we do uh, use metaphors in different ways we, we use different uh, concrete domains to understand metaphor which which is again dependent on the background of the uh, society and culture and so on fine. Is there a way to prove that is there a way that the that the simulation we are talking about is empirically um, uh, it is possible to show empirically. So, Metaphor is essentially cognitive and only uh, derivatively linguistic that we have agreed upon, but now we will talk about the empirical evidence if at all that there exists empirical evidence and if it does how does it prove that we are actually simulating that we are when we talk about time in terms of space this is actually what is happening. So, there is a there is a give and take between time and space at the level of mental mechanism. Time is so uh, for the brevity of time, I have chosen only a few of these examples. Um, uh, later on, we can uh, look at more, uh, I, I can I can uh, furnish more papers to look at it, look at it more in a more in depth fashion. So, one of the most important, most uh, well known researchers of our time, Lera Borodesky, looked at this understanding of the time metaphor in terms of space and whether we really simulate that whether there is a online right you know um, uh, online processing between uh, online um, give and take between space and time as you process metaphors. So, she said that time is not only spoken about in terms of space, but also thought about it that way which is something we have already been talking about there are a lot of structural studies in that. However, she is the one who showed us through empirical evidence. So, what she hypothesized is that if this is the way if we if a metaphor of, of time with respect to space is not just in language, but also in the mind that means, if we tweak the spatial negotiation it will also tweak our understanding of the metaphor with respect to time. Very interesting work and she has um, carried out in fact, a lot of uh, work in this uh, domain but we are uh, referring to the 2002 paper here. Um, so, this uh, they use two kinds of metaphor ego moving and time moving metaphors of time. We have already seen that either the ego moves or the time moves in terms of understanding of this. So, this was the sentence that was used next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward two days. This is an ambiguous sentence why ambiguous because this might mean two things why if you take on the one hand if you take the ego moving understanding of time then you have one reading of this sentence if you take 
time moving understanding of metaphor, then you have another reading. How? We will see. This was the sentence that was given to them was this and the question that was posed to them was which day of the week the sentence was referring to. So, now that the meeting of meeting that was supposed to be on Wednesday has moved ahead two days, when is the meeting now? Is it on Friday or is it on Monday? That is the Monday preceding the Wednesday. These are the two options that the people would give. Now, what they did was they did a slight uh, this was a priming experiment. Priming is when you prime the subjects um, in preparation of the target object that they have to actually process. So, what they did was before the subjects were uh, actually given the target sentence that the meeting has been uh, um, moved ahead, the subjects were previously instructed to either imagine a forward movement motion towards an object or an object approaching them. So, they were just told uh, close your eyes and imagine that you are moving closer to an object that is there you know uh, a bit far away or in other cases these are the two options. So, in one case they were asked to imagine moving towards uh, an object, in another case they were asked to imagine an object moving towards them something like you are standing at the, um, at the railway station and the train is approaching towards you that is one, one option. Another is there is a uh, food counter let us say in a um, in the cafeteria and you are slowly approaching the cafeteria. These are the two kinds of possibilities. So, the subjects the participants who took part in that uh, experiment were asked to imagine this imagine mentally imagine. So, what is happening here is that the subjects are told clearly to imagine a movement in space this is what is preceding the real sentence that was experimental the experimental sentence. So, this is the tweaking of the spatial negotiation that we had just talked about. Now, once that is done in the first case what is happening when you are moving towards the uh, cafeteria uh, counter the ego moving metaphor of time is primed. So, basically you are now open to understanding of time also in the same way ego moving way as a result of which they are, um, this was primed and they actually found that subjects mostly responded that the meeting now was on Friday. Why? Because let us say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday let us look at it like this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If this is the uh, this is the way it is, and the person has been already asked to think that he is moving closer. Uh, I am very bad at drawing. Just to say this is a human, and so the human is moving already on in space. That has been already told that you would please imagine this. They were moving towards. So now, if they have already imagined, and then the meeting is now here. Now, if you are moving across time and space in in the same way, then you move closer to the day, which is Friday. Right. So, if you are thinking, if you are imagining yourself moving across space in real life, then you will be primed to understand time also in terms of ego moving rather than the time moving. Right. And then this is what will happen. Now, in the second uh, set of test condition was the subject was asked to imagine something else is approaching you, the train is approaching you in a station when you are standing in the uh, platform. And in that case, the same person would or um, uh, would, uh, would imagine that because now because time is moving you are not moving. So, you are standing here again the same case now time is moving. So, it does not matter that you, you would remain standing there, but the Wednesday thing will move now to on Monday. This was the hypothesis that if you have understanding of ego moving in space or object moving in space then the time understanding of time also will move accordingly. This was the hypothesis and this is the result that actually proves that hypothesis and this was an experimental work not uh, merely asking them about what. So, they, they had primed the subjects and they had got the results that they were they had hypothesized. Similarly, they also did um, 
another another uh, type of the same experiment. So, they carried out this experiment in yet another setting, where they were not asking people to imagine, but they were asking, they were actually looking for people, they were actually um, uh, utilizing the real scenario in this, uh, in order to get the uh, understanding of how time was and time was um, conceptualized. So, this question, the same question, the question remains same, asked to people in queue for food in a cafeteria and the more advanced the in the line the people were, the more they chose Friday as the date referred to in the sentence. So, this is basically not imagining, but really happening. So, these people are actually moving in on a line to in, in a cafeteria in a, uh, in a, in a in a they are standing in a line. So, the people who are more ahead in the line, they chose more of them chose Friday as the um, a date, a date referred to in the sentence. Similarly, people who were waiting, so these subjects uh, were basically uh, chosen dependent on the scenario. So, the researchers just went and looked at people in the, sen in the, in the queue and asked, they were not primed beforehand. And similarly, they were also went and asked some people who were waiting in the airport to receive somebody and many other such scenarios, just went and randomly probably asked. And then when they are waiting for an object or a thing or a person to arrive and they are static, in that case again they got Monday as the answer. This has been a seminal work by Borodisky, of course there are many other studies after that, but this still remains a landmark study that shows that the spatial, if you can um, modulate the spatiality, if you can, you know, if you are embodying a spatial um, experience at that time, your understanding of time will also change accordingly. So, a direct mapping of spatial understanding on temporality, uh, on the one the way temporality is um, conceptualized in a particular scenario. And this is the, uh, the language used was of course, English. Another interesting study that looked at, uh, that, that looks at uh, processing of metaphor. Now, there are, there is, uh, when you talk about metaphor, there is also uh, another important domain that looks at whether metaphors are, you know, um, Con whether they are conventional understanding of the scenario or not, or do you process, in other words, do you process metaphors as it is, that means the connections are already made and they are solidified, or do you need to go via the mapping. So, do you go, when we listen to a metaphor, do we first look at the literal meaning of the sentence or do we understand them as it is. If we understand them as it is, then that creates a criteria, uh, that creates a category in our mind already. So, a lot of work has uh, taken place in this domain trying to see whether this is called direct or indirect understanding of metaphor. So, direct met understanding of metaphor will imply that metaphors actually create a connection that is stable, rather than you know you are creating them on the on the go as we as we uh, uh, encounter a metaphor. A lot of different paradigms have been used, but this one is um, a rather commonly utilized one, where the subjects are given a short very short story to read and the story ends in two different ways. One is it can end in a in a metaphorical word or it can end in a literal word. For example, let us say we are talking about a short um, story like um, uh, X and Y had a heated argument over some property issues and you know X had cheated out, uh, Y out of the property and they were arguing over it for a long time and then finally, uh, y stormed out of the room or Y left the room saying, I will see you. This is the last sentence of the story, I will see you. Similarly, the story can also end, everything else remaining same, the last sentence can say, I will, re I will take revenge for this. So, the point here is in the first case, he was saying that I will see you. Now, the will see you does not really mean that Y will sit down and stare at X. It means that he will see to it that he gets even with him. He takes revenge for the actions. The He will pay back for, you know, paying back again is a metaphorical expression. So, he will give back to X what he has done to Y, what X has done to Y. So, the sentence can end, uh, either end in a metaphorical sentence or in a literal sentence, both of them will mean the same thing. The story remains the same, only the last expression changes. Now, what they do is, what the researchers have done typically is that, there, there is a passage like this, there are many passages, each of them ending in a metaphorical or a literal um, word. And then, this is the prime, 
and then the follow, this is followed by a lexical decision task. Lexical decision task is a very common paradigm in um, word processing in psycholinguistics. So, what is what does it uh, do? Lexical decision task basically is a task where some letters are represent presented on the screen and the subjects are asked whether this letter string is a meaningful word in that language or not. So, for example, we can have a uh, let us just take this word itself. So, if we present it like this versus we present it like this. In this case, this is not a word, in this case, this is a word. This is the this is a very simple um, experiment and where we just try, try to see whether it would, the, the given entity is a word or not. So, decision task is a decision, but what matters here is how we manipulate this. So, what they did in this particular experiment after the story. So, there was this is how uh, experiments are um, graphically represented and so there is a story here and then it moves like this temporarily and then there is a word. Now, this this is where the manipulation comes in the story if the story ends in a metaphorical word and then there is a related word that is metaphorically related to that metaphorical expression. So, for example, I will see you is a metaphorical expression for taking revenge. Now, if the second if this is how the paragraph ends and then the word that you have to decide on is uh, let us say revenge. The relationship between revenge and see you is entirely because of what see you is actually metaphorizing, not in the literal sense. See you here does not mean seeing in the real sense. So, if the word that is metaphorically connected is presented immediately after the story, the processing time is very, very less as opposed to uh, presenting a word, let us say river you present a word that is not metaphorically related to the um, to the word that that ended the paragraph then the time taken will be longer so this is what they mean by uh, meant by that related words are processed faster related as in metaphorically related words are processed faster so this is taken as an example of uh, metaphorical processing is uh, is embodying the understanding of what is happening there and they are already simulating that Similarly, uh, similar, similar findings have been uh, reported by ERP studies as well. ERP is event related potential, this is um, a data that is um, that is col collected through using EEG electroencephalography. Uh, we will look at methods later in the in the in the in the course. So, EEG basically picks up brain signals as we process anything, it can be a linguistic task, it can be a non-linguistic task, it can be any kind of task, any kind of processing that you are busy in and as we pro proceed with the task, the brain produces uh, electromagnetic signals and that signal is uh, picked up by the machine and uh, this is what we have as a data. So, this, um, this particular study looked at ERP uh, data to see whether the, there is any qualitative difference in the brain activity when people comprehend literal versus metaphoric um, language. So, as I said the, not only is there um, the understanding of space and time and but also in terms of simulation as well as whether we understand metaphoric sentences differently from the literal sentences. These are the few domains where we have empirical data in terms of metaphor. So, in this case also ERP data shows that there is no difference difference in processing time between metaphorical and literal sentence, which means that metaphors are uh, understood in terms uh, as it is not via not going via the literal way, but as it is. So, this is a connection that has been already made and it is stable a stable connection has already been uh, made in the in the brain of the. Um, of the people who speak that language and as a result of which we understand that particular concept through that mapping. So, this is about metaphor, um, now we move on to yet another type of um, mapping that is metonymy. Remember we talked about metaphor in terms of cross frame mapping, now this is another mechanism which is within frame mapping, Met metonymy is a mapping that takes care that that takes place within the same frame. So, um, how do we define metonymy? We said very often words stand for something else. So, we may say that New Delhi rejected the 
um, hypothesis. So, this is something st standing for something else. New Delhi is not a person, New Delhi does not have a you know, um, uh, uh, agency as in as a human being that can reject or accept things. So, basically we automatically know that New Delhi is standing for the government of India. So, this is what we mean by words often stand for something else. Now, one such case is that of metonymy. Uh, this is a cognitive process where conceptual entity, one conceptual entity provides access to another conceptual entity within the frame. So, within the frame of governance, let us say that is the that is the frame right now, within the frame of governance there is the nation, there is the nation state, there is a government, there is a capital city and that capital city represents the government in its um, uh, uh, government to in, in this kind of discourse patterns. So, this is what we mean by one conceptual entity. Now, New Delhi, at the moment we think about New Delhi, the entire idea, the frame that it evokes is that of the government machinery. You have all those government, uh, major government offices in New Delhi and you know the, the whole picture that it uh, invokes. So, within that frame you can make sense of a sentence like this. These are some textbook examples, the ham sandwich spilled beer all over himself. Um, this uh, example is from Kobis's uh, book. So, the ham sandwich spilled beer all over himself basically is invoking the uh, frame which is the restaurant frame. So, the there is a person who is eating who has ordered ham sandwich and that person has spilled beer all over himself. So, let us we can easily imagine the, the waiter or waitress talking about a person who has spilled beer inadvertently. So, who is the person? The person who has ordered ham sandwich. So, this is the, is the, the frame in which the people are there and the person who, who has ordered a ham sandwich and who has also done something like this you know all these things are part of the frame where one entity within the frame is referring to another. So, the one that is referring is called the vehicle and the of course, that is the target. So, remember in terms of uh, in case of metaphor we talked about uh, source and target in metonymy we talk about vehicle and target. So, target is the one that is referred to. So, vehicle is ham sandwich is the vehicle here and target is the person who is eating it. So, rather than talking about the person who is eating ham sandwich, simply say the ham sandwich has. Similarly, New Delhi as I just said. So, this is the vehicle and this targets the Indian government denied the charges in the governance frame. Similarly, many other examples, this is very very productive, very common way of talking about um, abstract uh, domains. So, Obama withdrew forces from Afghanistan or let us say we can just uh, replace Obama with Biden, Joe Biden withdrew forces from Afghanistan. So, the target here is US government. So, this is the frame within a frame one entity can refer to another entity and that is why we call metonymy a process a cognitive process that is entirely within frame. So, source frames can be, so how, how is how is metonymy created like we talked about how metaphor is created similarly how metonymy is created. Metonymies can un be understood as I just said of um, uh, within frame mapping and because frames have you know many parts remember we talked about frames as having elements and events. So, these are parts of the frame. So, a frame has the government frame has many parts it has a capital city, it has offices, it has people, bureaucrats, ministers and then various other things and their jobs and what they do each of them and so on and so forth parliament. So, these are various parts within a frame. Now, if you look at it as a whole with parts, then you see that each element are part of that bigger whole that is whole picture and that is why frames can be often understood as uh, holes with parts. So, there can be some specific types of relationship within this part whole relationship leading to metonymic configuration. So, this is what we basically in language uh, most languages of the world employ. We play with words, we play with this understanding of a frame having you know a frame being the bigger picture which has smaller parts and then those parts can play with each other and with the whole as well and thereby we have this kind of 
um, this kind of sentences. So, this is there in literature as well as in real life literature we are not going to because this is uh, in this course we are uh, worried more about we are looking at more about how language commonplace language everyday language are actually indicative of the mental processes. So, we are not looking at may, there are many cells in the sea and uh, stuff like that we are looking at near simple language. So, if a whole if a frame is understood as the whole picture comprising of smaller parts then there can be various kinds of relationship the relationship of the whole with the part and the part with the whole and so on. So, part for whole for example, I will go to England this summer. Now, this can be taken the as uh, in, in both ways. So, if I say I will go to England this summer, I do not really mean to stay stick to only England as you all know England when we say I am going to England I do not I might even go to Edinburgh I might go to in other places. So, England here stands for Great Britain the whole country. Right. So, this is what we mean by when we have a part for whole reading of this, this is what this is how it actually works. So, I will go to England this summer. So, basically I am going to the country Great Britain and I might visit many parts of this, but England stand, England is the vehicle for us in this particular case to mean Great Britain. Similarly, New Delhi uh, deny the charges. So, New Delhi is one part within the larger uh, bigger whole of uh, government Indian government system. Similarly, uh, most people prefer ballot to the bullet. So, ballot again standing for ballot is the vehicle for the uh, for uh, democracy and bullet is on the other hand is a part for the whole which is autocracy. Similarly, the opposite configuration is also possible. So, we can not only exploit the part for whole uh, metonymic configuration, but also whole for part. So, he hit me let us say when there is a boxing match or something of that sort. So, when one one uh, participant is hitting the other person we do not say that you know he hit his nose or he hit his ears or whatever. Usually we say that contestant 1 hit the contestant 2. So, this is where it is the whole for part. So, the whole of the person does not get hit at the same time, but a more conventional way of talking about is is using a whole for part metronymic configuration. Similarly, the car needs washing the whole of the car cannot be washed as we all know the internal parts and the engine and everything do, do not get washed, but we still use a configuration like this. Similarly, America is at war. America the moment we say America most of us are, do not tend to think of it in terms of the US, but we can also look at the America as the continent which also has other countries which um, I know uh, many other countries beyond the United States of uh, America. So, these are the two most commonly utilized uh, metonymic configuration that we will find. However, there is also another which we will come to which is uh, the part for part which is a slightly lesser utilized one. So, how what are the kind of frames that get utilized for this kind of uh, configuration? One is the thing and part ICM, um, these are the theories that have been given that there is one uh, type which is thing and part. So, England um, is a is a yeah, stands for the whole of Great Britain. So, this is one bigger thing that has that is comprised of smaller parts. Similarly, the car needs washing and then there is also the scale ICM. So, there are things that are on a continuum you know for example, our age. So, we start with 0 to you know the time we ultimately move on. So, that is a continuum. So, that continuum is like kind of a scale similarly the uh, the heat. So, today's temperature is 30 degree Celsius for example. So, this is one particular point in that continuum which is uh, not exactly understood in terms of thing with part, but on a scale. So, scale ICM, ICM is the frame the idealized cognitive model we talked about frame also has names like idealized cognitive model. So, idealized because they do not exist per se this is a human man made uh, understanding that is why. So, ICM that talks about scale also is a very interesting uh, domain where metonymic configurations are very very often utilized. So, how old are you? So, how old are you? We never ask anybody how young are you even if they are actually young you know personal or you know uh, individual understanding apart a child who is 10 years old is also asked how old are you and the child will say 10 years. So, this is an way of a way of uh, utilizing this scale ICM. So, we use the word old which is actually at the other end of the continuum to even uh, ask a question to a small child. 
Similarly, he was speeding. So, he was speeding, speeding is at the again another end of the continuum starting with a very low speed. So, you go and you know through various stages to reach the final point where you will be considered to be speeding, but we will just say that he was speeding. So, this is a very another very interesting uh, domain another dom another interesting frame that utilizes this uh, metonymic configuration. Then there is constitution, constitution as in the how it is created, how it is you know not exactly in terms of uh, different parts, but the same thing that creates the whole thing. So, she disappeared into the woods. So, woods are basically a part this is what creates the forest. So, rather than saying that she went into the forest, we can easily say that woods she went into the woods basically meaning woods are the constituent part of trees, trees are constituent part of the forest and so on and so forth. Similarly, category and uh, category and members. So, sometimes what happens there is a category of um, an entire category that is represented by only by only one member of that category. For example, photocopy machines are all called Xerox machines. We do not, uh, it is more common to say Xerox, uh, I need a Xerox machine rather than saying a photocopying machine. Similarly, like aspirin, aspirin is one particular medicine that is part of that category of medicine that are used for a particular purpose. Similarly, detergents in India it is uh, more often than not it is surf because surf was one of the earliest detergent powders in Indian market that is why surf has become a face of the category detergent powders. So, it is very common if you just go to any small shop uh, in supermarkets of course, nobody really asks you can just go pick up, but if you go to a small shop uh, who, who that still exists in India in smaller uh, towns you will see this this is a sentence that is very very common via ek surf ka packet dena. It does not necessarily mean that the person wants only that brand, it can be any other brand, but they just want a detergent um, a powder packet. So, this is what we mean by member of a category representing the entire category. Similarly, aspirin, aspirin is just one member of the category of that particular category of um, medicines. Yet another domain is a complex event, Lakoff gives a very uh, beautiful example of complex event in uh, in his work, he talks about certain certain scenarios, certain events, certain um, experiences are complex event. They are not as simple as you know having similar kind, uh, having some parts and you know, creating the larger whole, but they are complex event that have not only that have holes of uh, that have parts, but also they have you know each of them having their own little small frames within that. So, hospital is, is such one such thing. So, you know you, you the moment I say I was in a hospital it does not only mean that you know you have gone there and uh, you can be as a patient, you can be going there as a doctor, you can be going there as a nurse, as a service provider or you know there are many other such uh, things. So, if you take one smaller part of that you can say that you know this um, there are scalpel, there is operation theatre, there is a doctor, there is a surgeon who is operating. So, you know he the, the surgeon operated upon the patient that means immediately you invoke that particular aspect uh, a smaller event within the larger event but you can also say that you know i went uh, to get my papers cleared after the uh, during the discharge during uh, the discharge of my friend from the hospital so these kind of things are complex events they are not simple things like england being the part of great britain so this is this because this this uh, includes a lot of complex um, uh, happenings within that similarly i speak english so when i say i speak english it doesn't just simply mean that i can produce produce sentences in english language using words that are meaningful it also means it should ideally mean that i also know where to use what what kind of grammatical structure should be utilized in one scenario the basically the pragmatics and the semantics along with the grammar of it so these are complex events. So, that also lends themselves to uh, creation of metonymic configuration. And now, we come to the lesser utilized, but um, still the, it exists metaphoric uh, metonymic configuration that, um, uh, that that is a part part configuration. So, one part standing for another part. So, one part is the vehicle, the other part is the target not the whole frame. So, uh, in this case this is uh, yet another type. So, we will say some examples like this the action uh, so, there are many um, kinds of frames again that gives rise to this the action ICM uh, while doing something. So, one of this uh, most common uh, met metonymic configuration of part part um, uh, uh, connection part part mapping is shampooing one's hair. So, the event of washing your hair 
these days everybody washes their hair with shampoo. So, this is very time specific and um, you know uh, place specific. So, shampoo is the object with which one washes their hair. So, this is one part in the larger event of washing hair. So, what we are doing here is using the uh, one small uh, one small element the shampoo and turning it into a verb and calling it shampooing one's hair. I have shampooed my hair, you have shampooed your hair or you know um, many such other uh, configurations. Similarly, authoring a book. So, author is one part of the larger activity the ICM that is the action of writing a book. So, author is one aspect, book is the product. So, author author and the, again we are doing the same grammatical uh, transformation of turning the noun into a verb and using a sentence making a sentence like author a book, similarly take a bite, sneeze the napkin off the table and so on. Similarly, there are other um, there is another um, ICM where is which is um, which it makes the use of cause and effect uh, mapping cause and effect into creating a um, uh, metonymic configuration. So, she is my joy. So, she is the person. So, the entire event, entire understanding of the uh, of a relationship within which let us say this is a kid, uh, this is a mother talking about her daughter. So, she is my joy. So, this is the person who causes me to be happy. So, this is how the metonymic configuration. So, the entire, entire frame here is the um, uh, relationship, right it can be any other relationship as well. It can be romantic relationship as well as um, a mother daughter uh, parent children relationship and so on and so forth. So, she is my joy, she is one part who causes that. So, the cause and the effect relationship. Similarly, the train road by train is creating the noise. So, we are using that as a, a mapping. Thus, we, these are just some uh, simple small examples as if you can just sit down and think every language has this kind of mappings possible. So, this kind of mappings as in we are understanding things, we are understanding objects, we are understanding events, even personal experiences of which is typically abstract in nature through certain concrete experiences. So, by using the idea of frame. So, this is where ultimately we can um, after we have seen that working how frame works, how frame also works in understanding different kinds of concepts not only just simple um, tangible ones through metaphor and metonymy. So, we can safely say that frames are a very useful um, construct to understanding human conceptualization. So, within that understanding of human conceptualization we see that metaphor and metonymy can shed light a, a very important you uh, know the, the, that, that gives us very important insight as to how human conceptualization process actually works at least in these domains. And then not only that the language is taking us to the conceptual domain of this and as to how we have a one to one connection between language and the mental processes cognitive processes, but also that this process intertwines with the culture of course, the language and culture. So, this brings us to the connection the the tripartite relationship between language on the one hand culture on the one hand and the cognition on the third. So, this is a relationship that is both ways you know it, it you can see that language is on the one hand it is not that we still are the final word has not been spoken as to what you know precedes what. But we as, as of now we have already seen that there are metaphoric expressions in every language, metonymic expressions in every language that do exist that may be different from culture to culture dependent on how a particular group of people, how a speech community or a cultural group you name it whatever you call it they have a way of constructing that, they have a way of mapping that and that uh, decides the choice of metaphor, the choice of mapping that we will be ultimately used and obviously, that whole thing that entire process goes uh, takes us to the conceptualization process of humans in a particular given uh, space and time. So, these are some of the references that have been used in this uh, particular segment. So, with this we come to the end of module 3, next week we will start with module 4, thank you.